Shalom and welcome everyone. My name is Christian Barry Nuevo and I'm the chairman for Love Israel here in Australasia. Welcome to today's program. Today's theme is a very debated one uh, amongst believers all over the world. That is the theme of eternal security, also known as once saved, always saved. In today's discussion, leading our discussion, of course, will be Dr. Baruch Corman from Love Israel. However, we are uh, doing something a little bit differently today. We will have a panel of guests that will also share their views and comments from a biblical perspective on this very debated subject. So, gentlemen, shalom and welcome. So, gentlemen, firstly, I'd like to start by saying that these gentlemen are um, not only all friends of mine, but highly respected leaders and Bible teachers. I have the total and the highest amount of respect for all these gentlemen, and it's an honor to have you all joining us today. So I thank you for joining us. Can I ask that uh, just for the sake of everyone watching this program, if you can please just uh, by way of introduction, just introduce yourselves. That'd be great. So Alex, can you please go first? Thank you, Christian. I'm Alex Genovese, Derek Prince Ministries, Australia. Thank you, Alex. Harry, would you like to introduce? I'm Harry Hammond. Uh, celebrate Messiah Australia. Thank you. Paul? My name is Paul Cohen. I'm a Jewish believer in Yeshua and I lead a Messianic congregation called Brit Harasha, meaning the New Covenant. Thank you, Paul. Welcome. Last by my name is Lise Baruch. Baruch Corman here in Israel, Ashdod, Israel. And I'm part of loveisrael.org and also in Israel, what's called Pedut Amo. Thank you and welcome everyone. And thank you for your time. I just mentioned by in the introduction that um, the subject of discussion for today is um, a highly debated one uh, amongst believers all around the world. Um, however, today we'll have an open discussion amongst friends. Um, we're gonna have uh, quite a few scriptures that we'll be looking at, uh, especially scriptures that have been brought to my attention from other people that they wanted some feedback from a biblical perspective from you, gentlemen. So I really appreciate your time today. So if we're all ready, let's begin. What we'll do, we'll, um, we'll start sharing a screen for the sake of everyone watching, because we will be putting up some uh, scriptures up. Uh, Harry and I will be reading these scriptures, and then we'll give an opportunity to uh, Baruch, Paul, and Alex just to give us their response and comments uh, for the sake of time, of course, we would love to spend, we could easily spend probably 10 or 12 hours on this subject, especially with all the scriptures, especially with all the, the people we have on this panel, with the amount of knowledge they have, but we'll try and keep the question, the answers as, uh, as reasonably short as possible, but making sure that we provide as much clarity as possible from a biblical perspective. So I'm just going to share my screen now with everyone. So I will commence the um, first scripture reading, and then I will hand over to either Baruch or Paul for some comments. So the first one is First Matthew 24, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So either Paul or Baruch, I welcome your comments and your feedback. Well, I'll begin because this, I think, is easier than the next one. In this passage of scripture, Yeshua is, is purposefully wanting to encourage the people in the midst of many individuals. Their love, their commitment is growing cold. And the problem here for most people, it says, he who endures to the end. Now, I hope that people would not think that our salvation is based upon our performance. So if you look at this verse as something that relates to a salvation issue, and we know that it says at the end, she'll be saved. But I would just call our attention to that last word saved. If we look at how it's used throughout the scripture, it can be healed from a disease. It can be restored back to a position. It's really a word of victory. And when I look at that, I see it as encouragement that our Lord is saying, endure to the end persevere because victory awaits you that messiah is returning and he's going to bring victory and victory in this sense is the establishment of the kingdom of god so it's not saying 
unless you perform well until the very end, you won't be in the kingdom of God. It's a passage saying at the end, victory's coming, the kingdom of God will be established. Thank you, Baruch. Harry, can I uh, please ask you to read to us the second scripture, please? Harry? Maybe a, a bit of a problem with the audio there, so I'll just read the second one, which is, as everyone can see on the screen, it is second revela revelation. Three, verse five. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Just before I hand over to you, Paul, just a side comment on this scripture. Some people have been coming to me uh, when they made reference to this scripture. They're basically saying to me, well, does this confirm that if you don't live a life of obedience, will that mean that you may lose your salvation because only people who are saved have their names in the book of life, not people that are not saved, but he makes reference here that your name can be erased. I just welcome your comments. Yeah, salvation remains a gift from God. And so there's nothing in that sense that uh, can remove us from that, uh, neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor anything. So in that sense, that's not the, the issue here. But uh, to the one who overcomes or conquers, he'll be clothed in salvation garments. But it is he who keeps us to that day. And so he enables us to overcome. So the church here that is addressed to the congregation is the congregation at Sardis. And they're having problems. And so he's asking them to repent and therefore keep the word that is being uh, out to them. And because they are being asked to keep it, if they repent and therefore are believers, then they cannot be blotted out. That's the point that he's making. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Christian, thanks. I'll read 316. You unfortunately muted me. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I think that's uh, for, for me. Yes. This verse is, is speaking about his displeasure with this congregation. Uh, I believe at Laodicea, a uh, one that is not committed. So just like we saw in the previous verse, we should never think because he says, I, I will not blot out. That doesn't mean that we should say, well, maybe he would. And in the same way, when we look at this passage, he's, he's challenging people not to be indifferent. Mm -hmm. When we are indifferent, it brings about displeasure. When he says, I will vomit you out of your mouth, my mouth, it's an idiom saying how displeasing it is for people to not be committed to grow indifferent to the things of God. And here again, I don't believe a true believer would be indifferent to the things of God. In the same way, I, I don't believe that when a true believer hears that, that God's love for them, his covenantal promises, that God has made an obligation through a covenantal agreement, that he's not going to ever leave us or forsake us. When I hear that, that I'm eternally secure, that doesn't motivate me to go out and sin. I don't believe it's the heart of a believer when God affirms his salvation, that promise as, as unchangeable, that we truly have eternal life. It doesn't generate in me a desire that says, good, now I can go out and sin because the whole reason I came to faith was to turn away from sin. So a promise such as eternal security wouldn't motivate me or I think any believer to say, good, now I can go out and exploit God's grace and sin and do the things that are displeasing to him. That's not the nature of a true believer. Yeah, yeah uh, Baruch, um, what, what I really enjoy about that, if you refer back to 3.5, that first little bit, he who overcomes, so in this, this one here, am I correct in saying that these are people that are not overcoming? 
yes, it would be individuals that, that have not overcome, that don't experience these things. Thanks. Harry, you can uh, just continue with this scripture if you can, please. Okay. Do you not know that those who run a race all run, but no one receives, but one receives the prize? Only one wins does not mean that others don't get a prize, is my comment. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. But now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not for uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, lest when I am preached to, preaching, preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, no, Paul, and no states does Paul indicate that he's talking about a loss of salvation here, but he's encouraging the believers to run with him. So together we may obtain that imperishable wreath or crown. Uh, at no states does he say here anything on losing salvation. Uh, the last phrase, when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. He's, he's not saying he will lose anything in terms of salvation, but he would lose one of the crowns he would have obtained as a work uh, that he has, sorry, as a reward for the work that he has done. Okay. Thank so you. So, Paul, uh, can, I, can I just go back um, to, to what you've just said there? Um, because if you read the thing cold, but one receives the prize. Okay. So I inserted when I was looking through this earlier today, but that does not mean, remember we, we're talking to a whole lot of other people uh, that would look at this. In a way, it looks as if one guy wins the prize because only one person wins. But in, in fairness, everybody wins that actually follow him. Sure, but the comparison that he's made is to somebody who's running a marathon and there's a group of people within this race, but only one wins the prize. However, for us, that's not the case. All of us will win this race, not because of what we've done, but because of what Messiah Yeshua has done. However, for our efforts, for our works, we will receive an imperishable crown. And some of us will receive one for uh, sharing the gospel or for being a faithful elder. There are five different crowns or wreaths mentioned in scripture and so this is one of those but it's we got to separate it saying he's talking about a physical race in which he's making a comparison only one person wins there but here we run and therefore he says i beat my body i run the race but i discipline my body so that people can take him as an example thank you if i could just add one thing real briefly the, the prize that he's speaking about is being also used. He's In this passage, he's speaking about his call, his ministry, his apostleship. And a very important thing to do is always pay attention to the words. And when we look at the end of the passage where it says, I myself should not be, be disqualified, that word disqualified, we need to know what it is. And it's interesting because we all speak English and we know the word document. And the word here is where we get the word document. There's a prefix, ah, before it, which means that he doesn't document. So what yeah. he's saying is, if I don't do these things, I'm not going to document the fact that I've been called as an apostle. I'm not going to be doing the things an apostle should document as an example, as a faithful servant. So here again, I don't see it as relating to salvation at all, but, but being privileged to serve God in this uh, call as his apostleship uh, is. Okay. No, thank you for that. Second uh, Peter 2, 20 to 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment 
deliver to them. Here, Paul, or here in Peter, is, is giving an example, a hypothetical example of what, what people would say if someone behaves in this way. I think what's so important is if we keep reading in this passage at the end of uh, 2 Peter here, we have a very interesting uh, state that he says, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 2 Peter 2. I'm in. I want to go to the end of it because it tells us, gives us a very important clue. So if we look there in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, at the end, it mentions, uh, we stopped in verse 21, but if you keep reading, it says, but this has happened to them according to a true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having been washed to her wallowing mire. And you know why a dog returns to his own vomit? Because he's a dog. And you know why a sow, after being washed, returns to her own mire? Because she's a sow. And what is speaking here is a situation where individuals, these are false teachers that are utilizing the word of God. But in actuality, if you read the whole passage here, where it says in beginning of verse 18, it's the deception of false teachers. So he's saying for them, the fact that they have knowledge of, of Christ, knowledge of the gospel, but they're using that in order to actually lead people in a wrong way. This shows that, that it's worse for them to even know the little bit that they do because we're going to be held accountable for what we know. But once again, it's not speaking about salvation. It's talking about those who are misappropriating the word of God for a evil purpose. But I don't see them as ever being true believers. True believers, if we look at the context here, it says uh, they speak words of emptiness in verse 18. They promise liberty, but they themselves are slaves to corruption. So these are individuals who are misteaching the word of God for their own purposes. They have a, a purpose that is contrary to the things of God. And he's simply saying here, it would have been better that they had never kn known these things because they couldn't uh, uh, misappropriate them in their way that they're doing. Yeah. A question on that, Baruch. Um, and that's a very good point. Uh, and we will have a, a, a more open discussion after we uh, look at all these scriptures. But it's important to what you just touched on there. I think that um, when we look at false teachers, and of course, we won't get into naming any of them, but I'm aware that I know that there's been some one or two people here that were very much uh, dedicated to the Lord and his work. They were legitimately saved, but then they've just veered and done a 180. And this would probably apply because they're ministering, but they're deceiving people. I'm talking from a practical perspective, and I know some people watching this will have this question. Um, what happens to those people that legitimately, because I understand that some of them have really never been saved. I understand that. But what happens to the ones that were legitimately saved, gave their hearts to Christ, were working in ministry, something has happened in their lives, and now they've just turned the other way completely. What would happen to them? Well, my hope is that if, if, as you say, they were true believers, something happened which caused them to, to begin to behave in a very contrary way to their faith, my hope is that uh, the body of believers would turn them over to Satan for, for the destruction of their flesh, but that in the end that they would be brought to, re to repentance, not that, that that act of repentance at the end saves them, but uh, I see it just simply incompatible with, with scripture that someone who's a true believer does that 180 and becomes uh, an enemy of the faith, an enemy of the cross. Lots of times people, I mean, I think we can name some ones that are very popular on television. They, they, they speak, they have made a life 
and a livelihood, a very good one, of peddling scripture. But we look, in fact, we, we, we just encountered a, a friend of ours that we were, were very, very, uh, I mean, I would say he was a very strong believer. We've, we found out now he's living in an ungodly way. He has uh, uh, denied that, that he ever believed that. I don't know where he is. I'm not his judge, but I, I know that when, when someone comes to faith, they're given eternal life. And if that eternal life can be lost, can be altered, then he never gave us eternal life. And I don't know, I think one of the other areas that, that causes some, some confusion is, well, how much of a sin? I look at the scripture and I see that the word of God speaks about assurance, knowing. And, and so we, we all struggle with sin. How much sin is too much sin that we lose it? How long does, does someone in a, a difficult position, maybe he lashes out, maybe how long, a month or two months? It's all this uncertainty and confusion. And, and I don't see confusion and uncertainty in God's promises. Okay. No, thank you for that. It, it's an interesting point. Just hang on, Christian, if I may. It's an interesting point because often when we look at significant faith characters, we often say uh, they're truly walking in the faith. But if we think of people like King David, a great example of a man of faith, yet he was a man of blood. He was a man who lusted after another wife. And there was a time of inquiring about who she was, then slept with her, then tried to hide the fact, then killed her husband. Was mm. he still saved? And the answer was yes, because his salvation wasn't based on what he had done, it was based on the work of the Lord. And so did he repent? Thank God he did. But his repentance just brings him back. And it's that turning from sin, turning to the Lord that is helpful there. But he's not saved by it. It's just an outworking of his faith. Right. Okay. No. Yeah, Christian, can I, can I just add? Uh, sure. I think um, the word lose is, is a bit awkward to use here. Um, I, I don't think you can lose it but you can walk away from it as per Baruch's example of, of, of his friend. And we would all know of people that have walked away from the faith. The question then becomes, was he, and per Baruch's example there, was he a truth, truthfully a believer at the time when he confessed that uh, the Lord was his Lord and Savior? That's and that's very difficult to prove or disprove, yeah. but I don't think you could lose it. But I certainly believe lots of people walk away. Yep, no, I agree with you there, and we'll touch on that a little bit later as well. That's a very good point, Harry. Um, we'll just move to the next scripture now. This is uh, uh one Timothy 4 1. Now, the Spirit expressively says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, given heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Yeah, and so when you read through that particular portion of Scripture, you see that some will walk away from the faith and they'll be deceived. Now, their salvation is still assured by the, the work of Messiah. Now, some of them will not be believers, and you see a similar statement in uh, 1 John 2, uh, in verse 19, where it says they went out from us, but they were not from us. And so as they go out from the believers, from the fellowship of, of the authority of the, the apostles, perhaps, uh, but they didn't belong to them. And it's the same here, perhaps uh, some of them will be believers, and they've just been deceived. And sadly, they, they will fall away, but they're still saved based on what the Lord has done. It's, salvation is never based on what they do. And so even if they depart from the faith, their salvation is assured, but their rewards are all lost. Can I ask a question then, Paul, in that, in that yeah. context? And once again, I'm going by quite a few notes and questions that I've received from other people that I know that want me to ask. So... If we look at a believer that, once again, loves the Lord, um, but 
when we read this scripture that it will depart from the faith, some will turn around and say then, well, if that's the case, then if I do depart from the faith, I know I'll still be saved, so I'll live in the world any way I want. What would be your response to that? And before, sorry, before you answer that, I understand that the rewards that are waiting for us in heaven, but some will just say, well, believe it or not, I'll be content just to enter heaven. So what's stopping me from just living in the world, knowing that I'm saved, as long as I get into heaven? What would be your response to someone asking that? Well, if they choose to live in the world, then you got to ask whether they were ever saved. Because if we choose to live in the world, they may not be saved. And so that, that's a real issue. And I think, yeah, I appreciate that uh, they just want to be saved. But if you only want to get into heaven because God lives there and everything is hunky-dory there, uh, are you really safe? Because if you're saved, you want to walk in the way of the Lord. And there is a response that is within us. There is a, a godly repentance rather than a worldly repentance in us. And that godly repentance leads to uh, the joy that we find in him. And, and at that point, you don't want to walk in the way of the world. You want to walk in the way of the Lord. So I, I don't see that they could. But even if they did, there is a divine discipline that comes. And so, as Baruch pointed out earlier, uh, there is an exclusion then from the body of Messiah. And you need to be put out of the fellowship. I know that a lot of fellowships don't do this currently, but they ought to do it. Right. And it, it means that there is an earthly punishment, but there's also an eternal punishment that comes. And that's that loss of rewards if they were saved. If they were never saved, but they just want to get into heaven because everything is okay there and here, it's not so good. Well, they're probably not saved and we need to preach the gospel to them. Okay. Uh, Christian, can I uh, just add on to that? If I look at that verse, I think an important thing to me is, uh, particularly in the environment that we're in today, that at times some will depart and appreciate because of all the misinformation and, and social media, we're getting vast amounts of information. But when I reflect on that and I look at history, whether it's, you know, anti-Semitism, whether it is the pedophilia in the churches, this has been going on for a very, very long time. And I think people are looking at today because they're so much better informed, not necessarily better, but they're informed. They keep saying, oh, look, this is, this is the end time because of what is happening. My question to Paul and, and obviously Baruch as well, is if, if I look at history, it's been as bad as what we've got now. Uh, it'll get worse, sadly. I, I don't think it'll get better. Uh, when we read through Revelation progressively, and I believe it is a chronological written book, uh, we see that things will get much, much worse. Uh, much of the Old Testament prophets prophesied of the day of the Lord, and that's the tribulation period, and things are not going to get better. Yeah, and I, and I think adding to that as well, while I agree with you to some degree, Harry, I think that uh, some things are, even though there's always been sin and there's always been things like this in the world, in some aspect, I actually, leaving the media aside, it is getting worse. I mean, uh, just the morals and uh, the values and the family values. I mean, I look back at, uh, let's say, 30 years ago on television, uh, you know, most swear words were edited. You know, it wasn't permitted. Now it's like free for all. And they can do whatever they want. So in certain areas, yes, I agree with you, there has been sin all around. But in some areas, it's, it's definitely uh, declining and getting far worse. But I yeah. agree Overall, overall, I agree. Um, my, my point is, is if you just go back to the Spanish Inquisitions or you go back um, to, to the, um, Hitler and what happened there, look how the church was conned, you know, and people, people just accepted this. You know, now, unfortunately, you're 100% right. Today, the same is happening. Correct. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, we'll move to the next scripture, Colossians. Alex, can you see that? Yep. No way, uh... Okay. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Thank you. Baruch. Is that for me? Yes, please. Um, one, one thing I would add here, I mean, what, what a great scripture. But, but the question is, right after the word, in his sight, that phrase, we see that dash, and the next word is if. In the Greek language, this is the word a. And although many times we see it translated if, it can, I would argue, be better translated with the word since. I, I don't see Paul as the one always trying to put doubt, but he's very affirming. And if we, if we realize that this word a can mean if, or since, notice how it reads, since indeed you continue in the faith that you're grounded, you're steadfast, and you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard. So I, I see many times that the translations come with a bias and a, a preference to, to put doubt into the text where I would argue that that word A, although it can be translated at times if, more often than not, it's better for the context and what Paul was saying here. If you look at the context, you who were once alienated, once you who were once enemies, but now it's a change. So I don't see why that that we should think if that he's sowing doubt, but rather he's he's affirming what a true believer, one who is truly reconciled to to the living God by the blood of Messiah that the Holy Spirit is going to work. I'm someone that, that puts a great emphasis on the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit to produce righteousness in the believer. Yes, at times we grieve the Holy Spirit. We, we sometimes do horrible things, even though we're believers, but the Holy Spirit brings that, that sense of God's displeasure, as Paul was talking about, mm -hmm. and, and it makes us want to turn back because that joy is no longer there. So I would just, just suggest that the word that really this whole passage turns on is that little two-letter word in English, if, I think it's better understood grammatically, vocabulary, as since, indeed, you continue in the faith. Right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. We'll move to the next scripture now. Harry, would you like to uh, share this scripture with us? Beware, brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart, unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Thanks, Harry. I think just before we uh, go to you, Paul, I think I want to focus on the first part of this scripture, beware brethren. Um, so obviously, and please, I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say I'm wrong many, many times, but beware brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief. He's talking to believers, isn't he, Paul? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish believers. There's no doubt about that. And so the issue that he is now having with them is one of the five warning passages within the book of Hebrews. And so there are five of them, and he's consistently saying, here's a warning, because the nation as a whole is not following the Lord. They are like in the time of the rebellion, when they were rebelling against the Lord under Moses, and they did that a number of times. And so he's giving them a practical example, saying, therefore, don't be like that. 
come back. Soften your heart. Have a soft heart. Let it be circumcised before the Lord and come back to me. Okay. Great. Thank you. And uh, uh, Christian, sorry, may I just ask, can we just add verse 19 there? Uh, no, not on the screen, but we can probably okay. read. Because it reads, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Mm. It answers Paul's point. Yeah, so if you continue to read in uh, verse 16, and uh, specifically it talks about the rebellion of those who left Egypt uh, under Moses. In verse 17, it then says their bodies fell in the wilderness. And so it clearly has a historical context back to the Exodus. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Alex, would you like to read this one for us, please? For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Thanks, Alex. Just before I hand over to you, Baruch, on this one, some people have asked to emphasize if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Since does that, if you can just share your views on how that, we can definitely not include that as that they can lose their salvation. You know, one, one of the things, I didn't know what verses I was going to get. I really hope that I would get this verse because it's it's one of my favorite um, in the scripture because of the assurance that it gives to us. If we look, the writer of Hebrews is giving a situation in order to stress something. If one assumes that this verse speaks about a situation where one can lose their salvation, then we have what, what the writer is saying here, if that's the case, if it's possible for this to be the reality that one has tasted the heavenly gift, they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, they, they've tasted the word, the good word of God, the powers of the age to come. I mean, these are pretty big things. Mm. Then if they can fall away, what he's saying is this, if that's the case that they could fall away, then it's impossible for them to begin to be renewed to repentance, which means this. This tells us that if anyone loses their salvation, if that is a plausible and a biblical uh, uh, possibility in the word of God, then we would have to use the scripture to say such a person who loses their salvation can never be saved again. Why? Notice the last part of this verse. What, what the writer is saying, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to shame, what they're saying is this. If you have a situation where a believer comes to faith, he is saved, then he loses his faith. Well, how did he become saved? Through the cross. But, the, but it wasn't good enough because he lost his salvation. So, so Jesus has to go right back and do, do the same work again because it didn't work the first time. And this would, would open him up to shame that, that, that the cross wasn't sufficient. It was inadequate. So I see this as one of the, the biggest scriptures as saying to the reader, uh, you cannot lose your salvation because if you did, it would imply that you would be in a situation whereby you could never be brought to repentance. So it would, be, it would make losing your salvation the unpardonable sin and we don't see any reference to this in the scripture that one uh is in if if they can lose their salvation that they become uh apostate that they, they, they become unable reprobate that they can't be able to be brought to sin i don't know too many people that believe that if you can lose your salvation therefore you become in a state where you'll never be able to be saved again so that's how i see this verse mm -hmm. Thank you, Harry, Alex, or Paul, comments well, on that? Just, just a comment, uh, I asked uh, Baruch to make a comment on. When I was reading that and I looked at the, um, the commentary, it gave an example 
you know, supporting your view, I, I, I suppose, but it's saying that it's, you know, all these people heard the word of the gospel, had all these benefits, but it gives an example of the seed, instead of falling on good ground, it fell on rocky ground. And because it fell on rocky ground, you know, they weren't able then to continue with, uh, with what they heard. Had, what, what, what comment would you make about that, uh, Earl? In that parable of the sower, there is those who apparently receive, but the cares of life, mm -hmm. the various things immediately mm -hmm. choke it out that there's no foundation for it to grow. So mm -hmm. I think the scripture does. I think that's a great, great comment, uh, Alex, that the scripture does show where there, the seeds planted, it begins to function, but it really doesn't materialize. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that with people. Uh, the, with joy, they accepted it. But as is that in that example, once they start experiencing tribulation, they go, wait a second. I've never signed up for suffering for my faith. If I have to suffer for my faith, I don't want anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. That's not a true believer. Mm -hmm. we, we need to realize the scripture says, and for example, in Acts 14, 22, it's necessary to go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. They hated him, they'll hate us. They persecuted him, they'll persecute us. So when someone is taken back by hard times for their faith, they've never understood the biblical faith. They have not heard the gospel. And let me just uh, conclude by saying, I think one of the greatest problems in Christianity today is that oftentimes the gospel that is presented is not a biblical gospel. I just heard the other day on, on television, this person was giving the, an, a so-called like altar call. And the person says, if, if you want the goodness of God, if you want the blessings of God, if you want to know life everlasting in the state of paradise, come and accept him. No call of repentance, no call of acknowledging of sin, no understanding of the cross, what he did. And th those people... They come, they're accepted in many churches, they see themselves as, as believers, but they have not understood the gospel. Correct. Yeah, thank you, Baruch. That's, uh, that's really good. Yeah. Um, may I just add what you said there reminds me if we go back to Matthew 24. Uh, if you look at 1022, he says clearly, you will be hated because of my name. And those are the people, uh, Alex, that, that had the thistles with them when, when, when it was sown, because they're not prepared, prepared to confess his name. Mm. Right. Thank you. We'll stay with you, Harry, if we can uh, just share Hebrews 10, 26 to 27 with us, please. For if we sin woefully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Paul, over to you for your comments. Yeah, the, the passage really starts earlier in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Messiah, Yeshua, like it clearly is indicating there is a confidence there and there is, in that sense, an, an openness. And he's saying, let me warn you, don't sin. And that's that second part that we see here. Uh, once you walk away from the Lord, and he's now talking to a group of believers uh, in Israel who were about to walk away from the faith, thinking that they could be resaved. And he's saying, that's not possible. What you will do is you will lose your rewards, but you will also lose your physical life. Salvation in the Tanakh and the Old Testament is often physical life, the salvation of physical life. And he's saying you will lose that aspect because the Romans are coming. It's uh, nearly the year 70 of the common era. And Jerusalem will be destroyed. You cannot walk away at this point. Press on to maturity in faith. Okay, thank you. Alex, if you could please share the next scripture in 2 Peter 3, 17, please. You, therefore, beloved, 
since you know this beforehand, beware at least you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Thank you, Baruch, for your comments, please. Here again, I, I can say in my own life, there are times that, that uh, have not been walking faithful with God, have not been steadfast. And in not being steadfast, this is true for every believer. When we're not committed, that, that opens the door for the enemy to get a foothold, to work his purposes in our life, for us to embrace air, the air that the same air that wicked ones do. So it's not speaking here. If you look at the context once more, it's speaking about a danger that all believers face, and that is a lack of steadfastness, a, a, a possibility of, of walking in, in the deceit, choosing that which is wrong, and not being uh, committed as we should. When that happens, we're going to see that the enemy begins to work out his will in our life rather than God's. So it's simply a call, a warning. I see so many of these scriptures and many that are used in regard to this issue as being warnings to take our faith seriously and not allow a child of God, the believer, to be manipulated by the enemy. I see today greatly, and this is going back to what Harry said and, and others, we're seeing in this age that there are indeed believers who, because they're not studying the word of God, unfortunately today in many congregations, the serious study of the word of God is very, very rare. And when that's the reality, it's going to produce not good deeds, but, but those things that are displeasing to God. And this is what, what Peter is warning here about how believers can be turned away from their steadfastness. But I don't see it relating to fall away from your steadfastness, i.e. you're no longer saved. I think that is a, a big stretch to make from such a passage, especially looking at what he says previously and what he says after. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, can I just make a comment on that? Because as as you said, Baruch, you know we're inclined, including me, to read scripture as we as we see it in front of us, literally. And you know, the question I ask you is, of course, we all know that he's talking to you, therefore, beloved. He's talking to the Christians, and he's saying encourage them to be steadfast. But what if they're not steadfast? They are Christian. And he's saying you will be led away with the error of the wicked. If they follow that path, would you then come to have? come to say that well they obviously mustn't say well look look how the verse continues so he's saying this is not what what a believer should be but if you look at the next verse verse 18 mm -hmm. but he says grow that word means to mature grow in the grace and the knowledge of our lord and savior mm -hmm. not potential savior but the lord our savior jesus christ and, and because he is our savior and we can rest in that, and it's not based upon what we've done, but what he's done, this is why the epistle ends, to him be the glory both now and forevermore. So when we look at this, yes, he's saying be steadfast, don't be turned away, but rather be like a true believer, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. One of the things I think so important for the church to, to realize is that grace, true grace, produces a desire to complete the purposes, the will of God. So when someone says, you know what, if I'm eternally secure, I can go out and sin and just live like a non-believer. Again, I said this earlier, but for me, it's so foundational. I don't see how a true believer who's turned to Christ in order to move away from sin, I don't want to live in sin. That was my motivation. So now having that assurance, if someone says, great, I, want to, I don't want to be steadfast. I want to, to be led away in air of the wicked. I want that fiery indignation. This is not the words of someone who has understood the love that they have received and that means of that love is the suffering of, of Messiah Yeshua. So I see it as just being inconsistent with the, the, the heart, the new heart, the regenerated heart 
of a believer. Okay. Thanks, Baruch. We'll go to the next scripture. Thank you, Harry. Would you like to read this one for us? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is, and is with it. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Thank you. A lovely piece of scripture. Unbelievable piece of scripture. Paul, over to you for your comments. Yeah, and so in John 15, he's giving a discourse. He's giving a, a talk to people who are standing around him. He's not just talking to believers. But he's also talking to unbelievers. And he's using the metaphor of the vine. And he's saying, uh, Israel in the Old Testament, that's one of your symbols. My father is the vine dresser, and I am the true vine. So you got to be in me. And he's encouraging the people around him to say, become believers. He's not losing, uh, he's not saying that everybody will be saved. He's saying, if you want to be saved, you got to be in me. And that's really the passage or the context of the passage. It is about being in the vine, being in Yeshua. And there is nothing in the context of the passage that says that it's only talking to believers and therefore you can be removed as an un as an believer from the faith of God, or from the love of God, from the grace of God. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, Christian, may I just add, um, if you look at Matthew 7, 21, 23 to 23, the Lord clearly says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And it comes back to the point that you just made, Paul, and also you, Baruch. I think that's really important for us to convey to whoever listens to us. Not everyone is that calls his name or, and you know, the, the verse goes on and says, you know, I've pushed out demons, you know, and I've prayed for sick people, etc., etc. You know, and uh, look what he says to them. Mm. Good so point. they were not saved as per Baruch. Mm. Well, that verse, I, I'm so glad here you brought it up because that verse Messiah simply makes a statement. Just because someone says, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean they're going to be saved. And what's the response of the people? They immediately go and say, but we did this. Yes, in your name. But we did that. Yes, in your name. We did that. The passage is telling us that when someone believes it's what they have done yeah. as a basis for entrance into the kingdom of God, what does Messiah says? He says, I never knew you. What's so important is that Greek word is oida. It's always in the perfect, which means I didn't know you previously. I don't know you now, and I will not know you in the future. So these people, when they were questioned about salvation, they, they immediately went to their works as a way to justify themselves. Uh -huh. Rather than saying, if, if Messiah tells me, Baruch, not everyone's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven that says, Lord, Lord. I would say, yes, only those who have accepted your sacrifice, acknowledge your death upon the cross, your shedding of your blood, what you've done for them, only those who trust in you. I think when a person says that, he's not going to say, uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So I think that's the key. What do we rely upon? Our works done in his name as the basis for salvation? I hope not. I hope we understand that it's solely based upon the cross, what he did in our behalf, and it's a gift. That's good. Thank you, bro. And Alex, I'll just get you to read the last scripture before then we open up a little bit, uh, a little bit further discussion. We open this up a little bit more. So Alex, if you can just uh, read the final scripture for us, please. Well said. Because um, of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haunted, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and sever severity of God 
on those who fell severity, but toward towards you the goodness, if not it, and towards your goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue, if they do not continue and unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Thank you. Is this me again? Yes. Romans 11, especially the second half of Romans 11, we need to realize who Paul is speaking about. He speaks about the world, the nations, how the gospel went to the nations. Now, does that mean that every one who's part of the nation is saved? No, he's speaking in a very general way that because of Israel's rejection of the gospel, does that mean all of Israel rejected the gospel? No, there were many believers. Paul speaks about that, the Mildreds that believed and are all zealous for the law in the book of Acts. So he's speaking in a very, very general way. Because of Israel's disbelief, the message of the gospel went to the Gentiles. But he warns, don't be haughty. And he's speaking about all the gent. Don't be haughty that that message went there because we also know that that message is going to come back to Israel in the last days. If we keep reading in this 11th chapter, there's that famous passage that all of Israel will be saved. And the vast majority of individuals interpret this wrong. When they say all of Israel will be saved, they think of Israel as simply the Jewish people. Should we really think that every Jewish person is going to be saved? I don't believe that's in the scripture. I don't believe every Gentile is going to be saved either. When he speaks about Israel in this passage, he's speaking about Israel as consisting of both Jew and Gentile that there's going to be in the kingdom of God, God's kingdom people. And I go back to, for example, earlier in this same section in Romans chapter nine and verse six, where, where Paul speaks in that famous passage, not all of Israel is of Israel. Now, this is a, a clear example of Paul using the same term Israel in two ways. When he says Israel the first time, not all of Israel is of Israel. The first time he means not every Jewish person is of Israel. What does he mean when he uses Israel the second time? The kingdom people. Mm. Elsewhere, he talks about the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth of Israel, when he uses that, believe in Ephesians, he speaks about both Jew and Gentile. So in, in later on in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, when he says all of Israel is going to be saved, he's saying that there's going to be, as we see in our day, a large number of Gentiles coming to faith. And then when the fullness of the Gentiles uh, uh, are brought in, in the very end, he's going to turn back for that remnant in the last day of Israel. And when Israel comes to faith, then it's going to be all Israel, meaning the Jewish component, and the Gentile component. What he's saying here is this, that in the same way he's speaking to Gentiles in this passage, and he says, listen, you need to be aware that the gospel was given to the Jewish people, and those who did not believe, they were broken off. And in the same way for you Gentiles, don't believe that the Gentiles have a market now, a monopoly on, on salvation, mm -hmm. because if you don't believe, if someone doesn't believe, they're not going to have that, that hope. Now, it doesn't mean when, when Israel was never saved and they lost their salvation, they had a covenant relationship, and that covenant was going to bring them the gospel. But because the majority did not exercise faith, they, they were lost. And the same thing he's saying to the Gentiles. If you don't exercise faith, you also are going to be lost. But he also says... And this is what I think we can all rejoice in. But, but if Israel, speaking of, of the Jewish people in the last days, if they, they do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted in. God is able to do that. And we should anticipate in the last days a great number at the end of the last days, at the end of Jacob's trouble, when Messiah appears, there's going to be a great number of Jewish people that are going to look upon him, come to faith in the same way Thomas did, 
not the best way. We need to come by, by belief, but they're going to see him in belief. So it just anticipates the, the message that was given to Israel, rejected, given to the Gentiles, but in the last days, it's going to come back to Israel. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm just going to now open the floor a little bit uh, to have a little bit further discussion. I, I want to say from the beginning, uh, right from the outset, that I've mentioned this to you many times, Baruch, as well. I am a firm believer that the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua is sufficient. Uh, I am also a believer, a firm believer that 100% that the shedding of his blood is also sufficient for our redemption. It's the perfect sacrifice. So I want to start by saying that there are other things and questions and scenarios that people have uh, brought to me so that I can bring to this panel for some discussion. So I just want to kick off a couple of things. First of all, in uh, Philippians 2, where um, it makes reference to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I just opened the floor to Baruch or Paul or Alex or Harry. What are your comments in regard to that scripture? Uh, well, it, it, from, you know, from, from the word of the scripture, it means uh, with fear and trembling, it means fear of, of, the, of the love of the Lord, that, you know, fear of the fact that you are a child of God and, and that, uh, you know, you need to continue to walking in that fear. And love of the Lord, so that your salvation is secure. That's how I see it. Yeah. So, would anyone? And once again, I'm I'm only giving a response of what some people have come to me with, because that's a great response. But when they then they focus on work, work out your own salvation. I'm not saying that I agree that we are saved by works. We understand all that. We all know that. But it's specifically making a reference to working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I see it as saying, because I am saving, because I've been saved, that salvation experience should work itself out. And when I approach God, as Alex said, with fear and trembling, with respect, with priority, God's priority, that salvation is going to produce. It's going to work out. Work out doesn't mean strive to make your salvation, but having been saved, allow the results of that salvation experience to manifest themselves so it's not looking at it as achieving it but it's saying because having been saved there should be results there should be manifestations of the salvation experience in the believer yes and and there will be a reward one day amen yeah. now thank you for that uh, Paul, I just want to raise the following question or comments to you just for your feedback. When we look at, and this is once, now we're going back to the Old Testament, but when we look at King Saul, I mean, he was chosen by God, he was anointed, but then pride set in, he rebelled against God. Uh, I mean, he took his own life. Some people argue that he would have lost his salvation, even though he was chosen by God and anointed by God. What, what, what would your be a response to someone asking that question? Yeah, people are chosen and called by God. It doesn't mean that they respond to the message of salvation. And there's no evidence that Saul was ever saved. And so in that sense, to start off with the assumption that he is saved is a really dangerous position. I don't think he was ever saved. He's not listed in the heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11, for instance. And if we look at his life work and what he accomplished and what he achieved, there are all signs along the way that indicate that he's not trusting in the Lord, but he's trusting in himself and his own strength. And in the end, when he visits the witch of Endor, it's a great example of, you know, what he truly believes. So I don't think he was ever a believer. So to base our faith on him would be a bad example. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Baruch, this is now another question that, once again, we can spend hours talking about. But when it comes to Solomon, in all his wisdom, um, what he ended up doing, what would be your view? I mean, if someone was to ask you, similar to Thor, 
what would be your response in regards to Solomon? Uh, did he end up being saved? Was he not saved at the end? Um, coming from the wisdom that he had, what would be your response? Although I, I believe strongly in the power of biblical covenants, I wouldn't be what's called a covenantal theologian. And what I mean by that is this. Up until someone makes a personal decision for the Messiah by name, the name Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, whatever language they speak, I do not see that person as saved. That's why when we look at, at, at the scripture, prior to Messiah's work, his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, what, what we know is this, when a person died, no matter who they were, Jew or Gentile, no matter whether they had great faith or no faith, they all went to a place called Sheol. We see that taught by Messiah himself. However, in Sheol, there's two places. One is, is Gehenom, hell, the Greek word Hades. It's a place of punishment. We have that example. I don't see it as a parable. I see it as a narrative of that rich man that goes to, to Gehinom, that place of punishment. He's in torment, in fire. And he sees uh, Lazarus at a distance. And where's Lazarus? Abraham's bosom. That second place in Hebrew, Chek Avraham, this is where people went who had the same faith of Abraham. And what does that mean? They believed in Abrahamic's covenant. The Abrahamic covenant spoke about the seed. And Paul tells us in Galatians 3.16 that that seed is Messiah. So Messiah, when he died, the scripture says in Ephesians, for example, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, that is in Sheol. And he spoke to those who were in torment in Gehinom, why they were there. They had no faith in God's plan of, of redemption, that he would send a redeemer. Those who were in Abraham's bosom, they were there because they did believe that God would send a redeemer. Kind of like we read in Job, I know my redeemer lives. And therefore, Messiah went there, proclaimed himself to them. Theologians say, why was it necessary for him to do that? The reason why, they had to also make a personal decision. So to answer your question specifically, yes, King Shlomo Solomon, he erred greatly. He lived at times an immoral life. But I do believe that, that he believed in God's Redeemer. He would have been in Chek Avram, Avram's bosom. And when Messiah revealed himself to those at that time, I believe he would have said yes to him. Those who are in uh, Gehinom, they are eternally lost. There's no hope for them. Those in Abraham's bosom, they would have responded. Today, we know that, that, that the scripture says in Isaiah that Sheol has been enlarged. There is no more Chek Avraham. When someone dies today, if they have accepted the gospel, they go, as Messiah says, that where I am, you will be forever. Okay. Thank you. And just before I open the floor for final comments from everyone, there's just two more things and examples that have come to me that I just want to share with everyone and for your comments as well. Once again, this subject alone, we can spend hours, but when someone blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, we're told that that's the unforgivable sin. So I've got a scenario here where in, for someone that's been saved, once again, even in ministry, things happen in their life, they move away from the Lord and they even end up, you know, in blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What's your response to someone like that asking that question? I'll open the floor to anyone. So the, the context of what you're raising is found in Matthew chapter 12. And it is at the time when Messiah presents himself as the national Messiah and that the miracles that he's doing are by the Holy Spirit. And because of the national rejection of Yeshua, based on the thought that he did the miracles by Beelzebub, that is the context of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When we look at it, we see that it's a national sin, not an individual sin. And it can only be 
at the time when Messiah presented himself. And so it is not a sin that today we could be committed by us or by another nation. Now we can speak horribly about the Holy Spirit or about the Son or about the Father. That's absolutely true. But that particular sin within the context of Matthew 12 is a national sin and not an individual sin. And it can only be committed at that time when he presented himself. No, thank you for that. Um, I'm mindful of the time. So I just want to open the floor before I uh, want to share a little bit more information on Love Israel and uh, the other ministries as well. But um, uh, there's one thing that's a bit of a side note, uh, and I thank you, all of you, for your comments and your participation. I hope that everyone that's watching you um, has been blessed. I always encourage you always to focus on the word. If it's not based on scripture, then I would certainly question things, whatever you hear, whatever you're told, and also prayer. Spend a lot of time in prayer and seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He can certainly reveal things to each and every one of us. So, I'd like to thank everyone here. There's one thing as well that I would like to touch on as a bit of a side note, but uh, we're seeing that even though in certain parts around the world, some restrictions are lifting, that sadly believers are not congregating. They're not, they're forsaking the fellowship. And I think that is very, very important for believers to continue that fellowship and, you know, going to, to have that fellowship and hearing the word I just want to open the floor very quickly to each and every one of you about your thoughts and comments and what you would say to people watching this program um, about the importance of fellowship in the congregation. Paul, I'll start with you. Yeah, while our salvation is an individual thing, our living out in faith and that fear and trembling is communal. And it means that people can speak into my life. If I live in a holy huddle by myself, Nobody can speak into my life. And we need that fellowship so that we can be corrected. We can learn and grow together as a body. Uh, we're not ever called as individualistic little believers. And we should you know, be like the desert fathers and sit out there on a pole. We're called to be a community, to be a family. And we cannot do that as individuals. So we need to come back and fellowship. There's been a time when we couldn't because of COVID. But in Australia, we're grateful that it's nearly coming to an end. Uh, in Israel, there's a new lockdown happening. But uh, when you can come back, come back. And in the meantime, stay in contact with other believers, whether that's over Zoom or Skype or phone or even snail mail. Stay in contact. Thank you. Alex, your comments on that? Uh, well, I guess we all know that uh, Hebrew verse of Scripture where it says, let's not forsake the gathering of the assembly. And I guess the big challenge um, for us, because I, I know even from our founder, Derek Prince, who used to say, if you want to really mature uh, in Christianity, have fellowship uh, with each other, because that's where you will grow in maturity as you rub shoulders with each other. So I guess to be the biggest challenge for the body of Christ is to ensure and to encourage people to come back to fellowship because you know, there, there is a danger that people would have liked the time of COVID and being nice and comfortable at home and not having to leave home and things like that. And the challenge is, you no, know, you can't stay at home, go and fellowship and relate with other fellow believers and worship the Lord together because that's where the blessings are, where blessings is. Amen. Thank you, Alex. Harry, any further comments to that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with both Paul uh, and Alex uh, and it's... Uh, a sorry thing that people have become comfortable by using the technology that the Lord has given us to listen to us and to listen to other teachers when it's convenient for them. But that's not what the scripture says. You know, the, the, the verse that Alex uh, used uh, that in, in Hebrews 10, as well as in Acts 2, 42, you know, come on, encourage believers to not to forsake the assembly. So we have to pray together, we have to sing together, and that's how we grow. And well said, well said, Eric. Baruch, your comments, please. Again, I, I concur with everyone. We, we need to be meeting, but 
I'd like to just share these statistics. This is from the, the World Health Organization, not a bastion of, of conservative uh, propaganda. But right now, there are currently in the world 19,670,000 people that have been confirmed with, with coronavirus. Of those that have it, almost 20 million, only 106,000, almost 107,000 have it seriously or critically. If you check here, that means that they are, how they define serious is that they are receiving some form of treatment. Doesn't mean that they're in the hospital, doesn't mean that they've been incubated, doesn't mean that they're gonna die. Only 0.5 of 1%. Yeah. Now, also that same organization estimates that three times, what number actually appears here, that it's three times greater, meaning for every one person that has coronavirus documented, there's actually three that have it. That means that the likelihood of, of you having coronavirus, getting it and having it in a way that you'll need some type of treatment, go to the doctor, have some type of medical attention given to you, it's probably going to be one in 800 people. Oh. I cannot believe that we're doing what all the world is doing for such a ridiculously low amount. Now, we're in a world. People are dying from this. I get that. It is critically very sad when someone loses a life because of coronavirus. But we lose lives because of a whole slew of reasons. But this, to me, is sheer propaganda, all the shutdowns, everything that's being done. It's for the purpose of, and I'm not a conspiratist person, but it is being done to ruin the economy. Because when you have a ruined economy and you have chaos, changes, political changes are easier to, to inflict upon the people. So I'm very concerned and the church needs to, the congregation of redeem need to be meeting. We need to stand up. Yes, uh, Paul mentioned that in Israel, we're going to have a new slew of restrictions for Hanukkah. What are we doing? Well, if we can't meet in the evening, that's what the restrictions are. You can't gather at night. Then we're gathering during the day. You can still meet. We're going to utilize it, not trying to be just, just you know, uh, um, disobedient, but we're going to obey, but we're still going to meet. And that's the important thing. Meet, pray together, fellowship, so important. Right. Thank you. Well said. And look, we've all agreed and we said this in the past, good hygiene needs to be applied at all times, not because of COVID-19. You know, we need to have some common sense as well. If someone's got the flu, you know, avoid it, stay at home. But I would prefer people go so they get prayed, but that's a discussion for another, for another day. So I would like to uh, thank uh, all of you that have joined us today. Um, there will be information on uh, all the ministries represented here today at the end of this program, where you can go to for information, where you can go for meetings, especially uh, in St. Ives here in uh, Australia. And of course, more information on loveisrael.org and of course on Derek Prince Ministries. So I encourage all people watching this, especially while all the gentlemen have sitting in this panel, God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Mm -hmm. So let's use that. You know, let's go back to congregations. Let's go back to some fellowship. Let's focus on the word. And the next program, hopefully, will be, uh, could be a subject that Baruch just touched on, that, you know, uh, the agenda behind all this, or it could be on the timing of the rapture. Either one of those two are very also very um, debated subjects which i'm sure people will be blessed and enjoyed so i'd like to thank you baruch paul alex and harry thank you so much for your time i'd like to uh thank everyone that's watching this program be blessed and shalom and thanks to all of you mm -hmm.